Greetings once again from Three Tree Hill Lodge and today we're looking at the fourth of the videos in our series. The first few uh, we looked at the protagonists, the Boers, the Brits and the events leading up to the war. And today we're going to look as the war clock begins to tick down. After the failed conference in May 1899 which was called in an attempt to iron out the differences between the Brits and the Boers both sides realized that the war clock was now indeed ticking down. President Kruger of the Transvaal left the conference in tears, but as depressed as he might have been, he is a very canny man, a very clever man, and he knew what the British High Commissioner was up to, and he knew that the war was coming no matter what he did. The Boers began preparing for war. For them it wasn't terribly difficult. Their military system was what it always had been. They didn't have a standing army. Every man between age 16 and 60 had to report to the nearest village or town. He elected his officers. He formed a militia unit that they called commandos, and he was ready to go to war. And when <clears throat> there was a, a major conflict in the offing like this one, well, the commandos had to band together under uh, the leadership of more senior officers, either elected or appointed. The Boers had rearmed. They had imported modern rifles and artillery from Europe. Uh, unfortunately for them, the old Boer general, effectively their Minister of War, had been so nervous about provoking Britain by ordering too much by way of armaments, he neglected to order the final 73 cannons from Crusoe in France, and they would never be delivered and the Boers will end up having far too few guns for the war. By the 2nd of September, the Boers realized that war was inevitable. And only a few days later, they became aware that 8,000 British troops were at sea. Reinforcements were on the way. And they tried to draw the Free State into agreeing with them to issue an ultimatum to the British and to strike now. Unfortunately, President Steyn still believed that this uh, serious situation could be resolved by negotiation. And so a four-week delay ensued. And those four weeks would cost the Boers uh, a great deal. But eventually, by the 28th of September, the Transvaal began to mobilize. And the 2nd of October, the Free State followed suit. What of the British? Well. At the failed conference, there was division in Britain. Um, the British public were not hugely interested in South Africa. The British public were becoming concerned that if there was a war, somebody would have to pay for that war. That was likely to be them, the taxpayers. They had become disillusioned with uh, the so-called gold bugs, men who had become very wealthy in the diamond fields of Kimberley and were now casting avaricious eyes north. Cecil John Rhodes, Bonato, J.B. Robertson, Bight, and others. They were firmly behind Milner and determined that the Bush should be overthrown militarily. The senior British general in South Africa, Sir William Butler, who felt the Boers were being treated quite shabbily by Milner, was eventually recalled for that very reason. An officer came out from India, Sir William Penn Simmons. Penn Simmons was not a particularly good choice. He had been in South Africa during the Zulu War, but he had never faced the Boers. Something of a fire eater. He eventually decided that if a further 2,000 men were sent into Natal from the UK, that would be sufficient to secure the borders. He decided after a while that maybe 5,000 would be better. Well, in the end, the War Cabinet decided to send out 10,000. The British government also decided to send out a more senior general and um, on the 25th of September, General Sir George White, VC, boarded the Tantalon Castle and made his way to Natal. Only a few days after he left the UK, the firebrand Penn Simmons moved north to the town of Dundee with a brigade strength. Now, to give you some idea here, the province of Natal is bisected pretty much by the Tugela River, flows from west to east. And back in the UK, General Sir Redvers Buller, senior general at Aldershot, had said, do not place any men north of the river. It is a salient. And he's right. The further north you travel, 
The war, you become hemmed in from the British perspective by Boers to the west, the Free State, and Boers to the east, on the other side of the Buffalo River, the Transvaal. But Penn Simmons, of course, would have none of that. Dundee, the town to which he moved his brigade, is over a hundred kilometers north of the river. General White arrived in Natal on the 7th of October and reluctantly agreed that Penn Simmons could remain in Dundee. But White had become thoroughly alarmed during his uh, train trip across the Great Karoo. South Africa isn't quite what he expected and his misgivings uh, are apparent in an extract from a letter to his wife. This is what he said. We should have 20,000 more troops in South Africa than we do have. The cabinet will have only themselves to blame if they have to reconquer South Africa from the sea. So we see now senior officers becoming a little concerned. The sands had run out and on the 9th of October Frank Rates, the Transvaal State Secretary, handed the ultimatum to the British resident in Pretoria, Cunningham Green. The ultimatum had only 48 hours to expire. The first condition of the ultimatum was to take men away from your borders where they're threatening us, specifically referring to Penn Simmons' men in Dundee. Secondly, don't land any further men in this country and uh, remove those that have come in in the last few weeks. And finally, let's arbitrate the issues uh, where we have differences. Well, that's not unreasonable. Milner was delighted. His boss in, in UK, Joseph Chamberlain, they've done it, he said. Lord Lansdowne, the Secretary for War, said, my soldiers are in ecstasies. But some of the other reactions in the UK were a little different. Uh, some of the senior officers were thoroughly alarmed. The newspapers, preposterous, they said. This will all be over by Christmas. And junior soldiers, I think, hugely overconfident. Uh, I'll read you a short account here from a letter to Lieutenant Reggie Kentish of the Royal Irish Fusiliers when he wrote to his father and said, I don't think the Boers will have a chance, although I expect there'll be one or two stiff little shows here. I think they're awful idiots to fight. Some of the Boers themselves were overconfident. Young men believing all they had to do is to do what they did 18 years earlier in Majuba. Um, tweak the tail of the Imperial Lion and they would sue for peace. Next week, we're going to look at the Boer invasion, the early battles, and on the horizon ahead of us will loom the spectre of Spearcock.